Is it mice or men, or sheep and wolves? We'll find out this week on Motoring 2004. PSN's Motoring 2004 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that. You know, whenever you mention the name Honda to a nuts and bolts guy like our Bill Gardner, he usually described the vehicles, especially the engines, as being bulletproof, very few problems. Design, well, that's another matter. But you know, it's been quality and affordability that has proven so successful for this company. But in 1986, Honda saw dollar signs in the luxury segment and with Acura became the first Japanese car maker to launch a luxury division. Like Honda, quality was not an issue, but design was once again bland. So in 1998, they introduced the new and improved TL to help add some spice and performance to the Acura division. The car was a big success, but now we've got a lot more competition, especially from vehicles like the Infiniti G35, and Acura sales have been on a bit of a slide. So this week, we're on the West Coast to check out the 2004 TL, a car that Acura promises will shed an image it admits as being one of a wolf in sheep's clothing. I give you the world premier sword of the all-new Acura TLX. Well, if we go back five years, it's interesting to look when we launched the current TL in 1998. The luxury market in Canada was about 56,000 units. Last year, full year, was about 80,000. It's grown about 42%. But there's been an increase in the number of competitors as well. I think uh, what they're trying to do now is to perhaps regain some of that uh, early, uh, early position and momentum that they had and focus, uh, focus on their technology and really kind of jazz the cars up a bit to make them, uh, make them more appealing and get people to notice them again. TL uh, historically has been an important car for us. It's sold over 25,000 units in its current generation, accounting for about 20% of, of our overall business. It really is what signifies Acura on the road. So with this car, we're looking to appeal to the emotional side of a, a person's buying decision. So for the new car, we thought we're going to attack the style front and uh, really juice it up and make a sporty, uh, compact looking and yet big on the inside uh, uh, daily driver that uh, every enthusiast would want to own. They know that the quality, the dependability, the reliability that Acura stands for is all going to be there. We really want to get an emotional attachment to the product and that's what we're trying to do with this TL. The outgoing Type S, although uh, a rocket uh, in a straight line, didn't really handle and break like we, uh, we knew it could. So we, we took out uh, in the beginning with a plan to, uh, to improve uh, braking and handling, more so than focusing on just more acceleration. We've raised the uh, capabilities significantly uh, by uh, all the magazine type numbers that, that it'll post. It's going to beat all the competition out there. 270 horsepower, a little more uh, torque as well, and smoother, and uh, it holds on longer out toward the end of the, uh, the power curve, so it feels like it pulls forever. Uh, the braking and handling, uh, much shorter stopping distance, best in class, uh, road holding in terms of max lateral G and slalom speeds and so on, best in class as well. Acura is coming from behind a little bit. They've always been a good car, but they've never been seen as a true sports car with passion and fire. And that's what they've got to put in the car. And the new TL goes a long ways to putting that back in. I had to go over a hill to get the suspension fully unloaded and then accelerate hard on the way back down to the suspension loading 
before I could even figure out that it was just a front wheel drive car. It performed so well, it was just like any other rear wheel drive car that I've driven in a long time. I think the TL is really, uh, really worth a look. You know, um, the the guys at Acura say that they want to, they want uh, something that will compete with the 5 Series BMW and the E-Class Mercedes, and uh, without having to pay the money for that. And uh, and you know, this car has uh, has all the features that you'd want, plus some you don't expect. The DVD audio system is terrific. It's just mind blowing. And uh, you know, there's a good place to start when you're talking about the car. You know, this one is going to start turning heads. They've got a body kit out now. They've got accessories, but even in its basic shape, it's really, for Acura, edgy. It's going to turn heads. It's going to turn things around a bit. I mean, this is going to get us going. It's going to get us going back in a positive direction. But hey, listen, let's not to say things are that bad as they are. Acura division has grown from uh, you know, selling just a few thousand cars when we started. The last two years we've done over 25,000 each of those past two years. We're going to challenge that result again this year. It's been a little tough, but we think with the TL that we're going to surpass that level and uh, continue to grow. I'm not walking like an Egyptian. Can you guess? More later on Kenzie's Corner. A lot of people wondered what would happen when Daimler swallowed Chrysler. Well, wonder no more because on this edition of Test Drive, we take a look at the very first product of that merger. This is the all new Chrysler Crossfire. The Chrysler Crossfire was developed in just 24 months. A year after the idea was hatched, the concept version of the car was revealed at the 2001 North American International Auto Show in Detroit. Another year later, well, the wraps were pulled off the production vehicle. Now that time frame is short, and it is so for good reason. You know, this new Crossfire represents a win-win situation for both Daimler and Chrysler, because beneath the skin, this car is nothing more than a fixed roof Mercedes-Benz SLK. Now you might say, hold on a sec, how can it be win-win? Very simply, the Mercedes-Benz SLK is about to be replaced and so all of its engineering, well, it would have been put out to pasture. Now what they do is they lend it to Chrysler. Chrysler then end up with a Crossfire and a wonderful sports car. Mercedes-Benz, on the other hand, well, they get another five, six or seven years out of a platform that would have been put to waste. Where the Crossfire betters its donor is in the body's structural rigidity. The fixed roof makes for a much tighter platform and a healthy place for the suspension to hang its hat. As you might expect, most, if not all, of the mechanicals came from the Merck side of Daimler Chrysler. In the suspension's case, this means a double wishbone design up front, a five-link system in back and anti-roll bars at both ends. Through the pylons, the Crossfire remained flat and unflustered, with both body roll and understeer being benign. The crisp turn-in afforded by the steering and meaty 225-40ZR18 front and 255-35ZR19 rear tyres really do help the cause. Bonus marks for the suspension, however, as there's enough compliance built in, so the ride is actually pretty good. Climb behind the wheel of the Crossfire and, well, you'll find everything you expect to find in a $50,000 sports car. To begin with, the seats are fabulous. They keep you planted when you're hairing around the corner, but don't feel confining when you're cruising down the highway. You also get a great radio, effective climate controls and a great set of gauges. That, however, is not to say everything is hunky-dory. To begin with, you get telescopic steering, but no tilt. Now, if you happen to sit tall in the saddle and have short legs, as I do, it chops the top of the dials off. The other thing, and this really is a joke. Ladies and gentlemen, the coffee cup holder. A stout 3.2 litre engine that pumps out 215 horsepower and 229 pounds feet of torque drives the rear wheels. The response to throttle input is surprisingly swift 
but more importantly, it manages to sustain that impression well beyond legal speed limits. The strong feel is helped enormously by the 5-speed automatic and its manual mode. For those into serious driving, the 6-speed manual box is the better choice, as the gate is nicely defined and the clutch is both light and progressive. You know, the single biggest drawback with this Crossfire is the view through the rear view mirror. It's non-existent with the spoiler down, with the spoiler up, well, it shaves about 30% off the view. Thankfully, the side view mirrors, well, these things are large enough and well enough placed that you actually get a decent view to the rear. Now, the need for this spoiler is an important one. At moderate speeds, it puts about 40 pounds of downforce onto the back end, which improves stability. If you really start honking along a main road, well, it adds up to about 150 pounds feet of force. So in spite of what it does to the view through the rear view mirror, it's a must. Stopping power comes from four-wheel disc brakes and an excellent anti-lock system. The pedal feel is crisp and the stop short and fade free. The system also functions to provide traction control and a good dynamic stability control package. Whenever you cross the traction threshold, the system backs off the power and brakes one or more of the wheels to bring the car back into line. It really does reinforce the car's overall balance as it hardly ever comes into play. Daimler Chrysler suggests the crossfire is what happens when Route 66 and the Autobahn collide. Regardless of how you want to couch it, what makes or breaks a car is the engineering beneath the sheet metal. In the SLK it worked very well, in the crossfire, well it makes for one sweet set of wheels. Our Midas tip of the week concerns improving your fuel economy. Two key items you want to keep an eye on under the hood are spark plugs and air filters. When it comes to air filters, most manufacturers require that you inspect and or replace the air filter at approximately 40 to 48,000 kilometer intervals under ideal conditions. However, if you're driving in a dusty, dirty area, you may require a filter even more frequently than that. In most cases, the air filter is fairly easy to get at, and in some cases may even be owner serviceable. So have a look at your air filter or have your technician look at it. If it's restricted, it's going to hurt the power of your engine and you'll find that putting in a clean replacement air filter may give you more pep with less throttle opening and that'll translate into better fuel mileage. Make sure that you get a quality, proper fitting air filter from a reputable manufacturer. When it comes to spark plugs, most modern vehicles have platinum tip spark plugs that could last as long as 160,000 kilometers. Check your owner's manual to see what type of spark plugs you've got, and if you're in any doubt, have them removed for inspection. Now here's a set of spark plugs that I had to replace in one of my own vehicles just a few weeks ago. I had to replace them to get it through an emission test, but I had the secondary benefit I noticed afterwards. It passed the emission test, but I had better fuel mileage as well. That's your Midas tip of the week. The uh, Be Tire Smart program is to heighten the awareness of Canadian motorists about just how important it is to maintain the tire pressure on their car and to look at the tires to check the wear on them, make sure they're driving on tires that are safe and to be aware of what stage of, of life their tires are at. So this is an excellent program to uh, just heighten the awareness of uh, how important tires are and how simple it is to maintain them as well. But by and large, uh, Tire pressure is usually adjusted for free, and that's probably the last frontier of anything free in the automotive business. We uh, conducted the market research uh, last January, February, uh, where we went out across Canada with engineering students from uh, six universities in Canada, and we intercepted consumers at gas stations and service stations, and we had a about a five ten minute interview with them about the whole topic of proper tire inflation and we had two engineering students taking so down the actual physical information and that gave us incredibly accurate results. We ended up with about 1800 consumers. There's never been a study anywhere in the world this big looking at this particular issue. 70% of the vehicles 
had at least one tire over or and or under inflated by at least 10 percent and there's about 40 percent had it at least over or under inflated by at least 20 percent a 20 percent under or over inflated tire is actually very dangerous collectively you look at of all the underinflated tires, the, the yeah. extra well, gasoline that's used, it amounts to over 600 million liters a year, and that results in a million and a half tons of carbon dioxide every year. That's just the extra caused by poorly inflated tires. That's why we've come at this uh, as an important part of the Government of Canada's drive to improve the fuel efficiency of cars. We're doing it in a lot of fronts, trying to make more efficient cars get uh, sold, a number of other ways, but, but improving the tire pressure leads to that improvement in fuel efficiency, which contributes towards our overall Government of Canada plan for reaching our Kyoto goal. Okay, so we know that proper tire inflation is important for safety, performance, and fuel economy. But how many of us are actually going to check our tire inflation on a regular basis? Well, the new Acura MDX comes with a tire pressure monitoring system. It's not new, but it's becoming more popular. The question is, does it work and is it a sign of the future? Well, I think that Bill is finished with his MC duty, so let's check out with Bill and ask him that question in the Quaker State Garage. Well, Brad, they absolutely work, and, they're, and they've been around for a couple of model years on certain vehicles. Chevy Corvette, for example, several model years ago, they went to a run-flat or zero-pressure tire so they could elim eliminate the spare. The problem with a run-flat tire is the carcass of the tire is so robust, so heavy, that you can have a completely flat tire, no air pressure in a tire, and you don't know it. It doesn't look flat, doesn't even look underinflated because it's such a strong carcass. So you have to be able to notify or alert the driver of the vehicle to the fact that he or she has a zero pressure or flat tire in that vehicle. So hence the tire pressure monitoring system. On the Corvette, what they do is they mount a sensor. This wheel's off a Pontiac Grand Prix, but if this was a Corvette wheel, just inboard of this valve stem hole, there would be a sensor mounted in the wheel that transmits a signal to alert the driver that, the, for example, the tire on this rim was under inflated or zero pressure. Now, the downside to this system is the fact that the sensors themselves are quite expensive, several hundred dollars a piece, and they're very fragile and easy to break if you don't know what you're doing. I was at Johnson & Magwood Tire earlier this summer and I saw a stack of wheels and tires off a Corvette and I didn't see a Corvette in the shop that would match them. Started asking some questions and the boys told me that these tires had been mounted at another shop that didn't realize what, how the vehicle was equipped and they had inadvertently or accidentally broken all four sensors on this car. So they had to demount the tires, replace the sensors and remount and rebalance the tires. It was a pretty expensive proposition. So, you know, that just goes to show you, if you don't have trained personnel working on a sophisticated vehicle, it can get really expensive. Now, GM has a system that they're already using as well for several model years on some of their other vehicles. Works a little bit differently. I had a Pontiac Grand Am in the other day for work. Was in for a tune-up, and when I road tested it, I got rid of the mist, but I saw a light on on the dash that ind indicated an underinflated tire. And what they do on the Grand M is they look at the input from the anti-lock brake sensors, which are one per wheel as well. And if that wheel speed sensor on one particular wheel is consistently below the value of the other three, the system knows that it's got a tire that has an effectively reduced diameter or is underinflated, and it turns the light on. But it looks at that underinflated tire for a period of time before it turns the light on. The system on the Corvette works immediately. But you know what? It's going to be a lot of years before all the vehicles are equipped with tire, mon tire pressure monitoring systems. There was talk of it being mandated to kick in in 03, but it's not here yet. And it'll be a lot of years before all those old vehicles that don't have them get off the road. So you're probably looking at another 10, 15, maybe 20 years of having to use the old standby, the tire pressure gauge. Make sure you got one of these, you know how to use it, and you use it regularly. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2004.
Now, maybe they think they're doctors and, and they can save a life, or maybe they think they're the Incredible Hulk and they can pull a vehicle off a poor crash victim, or maybe they're the crack reporter for a big city newspaper and they think they've got a big scoop. But why do people stop and stare at crash scenes on the highway? For crying out loud, people, get a move on. Brad saw a guy the other day at a crash scene. He's driving along, videotaping the thing while he's driving. What's wrong with these people? Do they have some kind of morbid curiosity? They want to see bleeding flesh and crumpled sheet metal? The worst guys, of course, are the folks that are driving along. Hey, Martha, look at that. Boom. And then they have their own crash. Chain reaction. Now, I'm not talking about you motoring viewers. You're way too smart to do that. But what's up with these people? Now, some people, I don't know where they get this idea, think that I have somewhat of a competitive nature. Now, if they've ever seen me race, they know that's not true. But I look at a crash scene, not wishing to profit from someone else's misfortune, as a chance to get by a bunch of people. I'm over there in the right lane, as usual, and I slide right on by the rubberneckers and beetle on home. Now, of course, if there are any cops in the area, the chances are they're back there. You've got a wide open road. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that you break the speed limit, but you might get home just a little bit sooner. So, in the words of that immortal police officer, next time you come across a crash scene, nothing to see here, people. Move along, move along. From South Park, I'm Officer Bar Brady. Well, after only a day behind the wheel of the 2004 Acura TL, I gotta say that along with the Honda S2000 and the Acura NSX, this is the best performing Honda product I've ever driven. It's that good and it's that much fun to drive. But as we heard earlier, Acura is hoping to regain some sales by adding some sizzle to the styling. Have they accomplished that? Well, I think they are headed in the right direction. But you know, it might have been said best earlier today back at the hotel by the son of a TL owner. He spotted a new model in the parking lot, looked at his dad and said, hey dad, the new TL looks a lot like the Mercedes-Benz or a BMW. Well, an Acura executive was standing beside me. He overheard the comment and he looked at me and he said, that's good. So there you go. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Let's say two pickup trucks. You drive one on a given route and then you immediately switch into another one and drive it on the same route, same conditions. So you get to do a back-to-back -back comparison, which is much more valid when you're trying to compare vehicles. TSN's Motoring 2004 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, total car care, we do that.